Hi, everybody. This is Dan Helfrick from Z-Band. Apologies for the slightly late arrival there. I was just uh, finishing up this presentation and wanted to um, jump on and tell everyone uh, that this is going to be a little bit different from our standard presentation. This one is going to be uh, pretty much vendor neutral, Consider it to be informative. Um, so we're not going to be pushing any Z-Band product or any specific Z-Band application as we have these conversations. This is going to go strictly through uh, video compression and the world kind of as we see it today. Um, in video and what it means for where we're at now in the industry and what we think it might mean for the future. And I'll be very clear when I'm giving conjecture or my opinion versus what is actually um, you know, factual and industry recognized information. So I'm gonna hold on a, another minute or two here and then get started, but I did just wanna make sure that everyone was aware that this is more of an informative presentation than it is uh, on anything that I would consider to be a, a Z-Band specific product. So I'll hang on for about a minute and then we'll, we'll jump right into to everything. All right, I'm going to get started. Looks like our number of attendees is staying uh, pretty steady. So, as I said, this is on uh, this this presentation is on video compression technologies, um, and it's going to be a vendor neutral presentation. We're going to focus more on the actual um, the technology behind what's going on in the broadcast world today than we are going to focus on any of the uh, actual Z band technologies. It will reference some of the products that we have and where we utilize them here, but um, it won't necessarily be doing anything from a demo standpoint. Um, so what is video compression and why does it matter? Why do we feel like it's interesting to do this webinar? Um, so video compression is utilized today in basically all broadcast uh, content that you view. Uh, this is everything from your uh, antenna that you throw up on the roof to pick up your local TV channels to DISH and DirecTV satellite to your cable providers. And the reason that everyone has to utilize uh, compressed video is because video that we're getting into today or as we are starting to get into this world of digital and high definition is big. I mean a standard Blu-ray video content is going to be 30 to 40 megabits per second if it's uncompressed which is problematic because a standard RF channel, um, you know, channel three, channel four, one of those six megahertz wide channels that is uh, being sent to you from Comcast or Spectrum or, or RCN, whoever your, your service provider happens to be, is, only, is six megahertz wide and only fits about 38.8 .8 megabits of bandwidth. So it is possible that a fully loaded 1080p bit of video can absolutely override um, a six megahertz stream. So the answer to this kind of riddle is that we have to compress the content. And once we start getting into OTT applications and talking about uh, web streaming, that becomes a, an even more problematic thing. Um, so the issue with compressing or the idea of compressing video is it can't be a free for all, right? Um, we have to make sure that any video that's being compressed can be decompressed on the other side or decoded on the other side. And the group that does that in as far as that we're concerned or in the broadcast industry that we deal with is the moving picture experts group, uh, commonly referred to as MPEG. Um, MPEG was established in 1988 and has, uh, we deal with them on the broadcast side of things primarily in uh, video and audio compression, so MPEG-1, MPEG-2, those types of things, but then we will, they also deal with multimedia, image compression, uh, and there's a number of other standards that they utilize or are are behind the scenes in, in writing the standard and making sure um, that 
the way video is compressed and decompressed worldwide is a standardized thing. Um, and for the purposes of how we view things or how things are done uh, in the broadcast industry today, it's a decoder standard. And what that means is the standard applies to the television or to the set-top box more so than it does to the actual encoder or modulator that's on the front end. So when you have a manufacturer that's telling you that their encoding algorithm is better than their competitors, and it's, you know, it's got less loss or it does a, a better job of reducing the amount of data, that can actually be accurate. That's not necessarily a, an inaccurate statement uh, because as long as they are writing their encoding and their compression algorithm to the standard so that the decoder can read it, that can read it <laughs> there is some variance on what can be done for the the actual encoding algorithm itself, which is an important bit of information. Um, and so where's this used today? <laughs> I, I picked this image of uh, the HBO uh, Game of Thrones because there was a big uproar this year over the Battle of Winterfell episode being too dark. And the cinematographer behind the Battle of Winterfell episode um, so no, it's not too dark. He's, I shot the episode. I'm a professional cinematographer. I assure you that the, the episode is, is not too dark. And, and it turns out, and I did some personal experimentation on this, but whether or not the Battle of Winterfell episode of Game of Thrones was too dark was really a, a factor of what streaming service that you utilized or what service that you utilized to view um, the episode. So my wife and I watched it live uh, Sunday night on DirecTV Now, which is our streaming service. And I was one of the people who came into work the next day complaining that it was too dark. I couldn't see things. Some of the images weren't clear. Um, and so I talked to some of the folks here at the office who had used different services, who had gone directly to HBO's platform to utilize it, and they did not have the, the same issue. Um, so... I have a, a Google Home is my home internet and Google Home. If you pull up a specific device using your, your Google Home system, you can actually check the uh, Wi-Fi and the bit rate that's being utilized for each device. And so I started streaming the episode on DirecTV now and was pulling five to six megabits per second. So a relatively compressed stream for 1080 video. When we were talking about uh, in the, previous slide, uh, an uncompressed stream being 30 to 40 meg to be pulling six or eight meg means there's a lot of compression going on behind the scenes, which isn't necessarily a deal breaker or a bad thing. But uh, when we went over to the HBO Now service and pulled the exact same episode, not only did my video quality improve and have less issues with darkness and seeing things, um, but the bandwidth doubled on the HBO Now or HBO Go services. I was running uh, at about 13 to 14 megabits per second for the exact same episode of television on the same TV. The only difference being switching from DirecTV Now to HBO Go. Um, and the reason that I'm telling you this story and that it's relevant to this presentation is that is strictly down to a difference in either A, hosting capabilities and, and bandwidth capabilities of the server um, for DirecTV Now versus HBO Go, or down to the compression algorithm that was utilized by um, DirecTV Now versus the compression that's done if it's, it's hosted directly on an HBO server. So that is one of the places that we see this, where we see video compression utilized is in OTT streaming. Um, it's utilized in security cameras, it's utilized in video conferences, it's utilized in uh, cable TV, but the, the place where most of us interact with it is in this OTT streaming side of things where you're at home, you're watching Netflix, and Netflix is uh, the content's in 4K. For point of reference, 4K is a uh, literally means four times uh, 1080. So you have four times the amount of content in a 1080, uh, or yeah, four times the amount of content in a 4K stream is what you do in a 1080 stream. So when we're talking about 4K video, if, I, again, I'm back to uh, my DirecTV Now example, and I have six meg 
uh, 8 meg for a 1080 stream, once I've got 4K video, now I'm 24 to 28 to 30 megabits per second for 4K video content. And you'll notice with your terms of service for Netflix and uh, Amazon, they actually do recommend a minimum uh, incoming pipe or internet bandwidth of 25 megabits per second for 4K streaming. So this is our most common interaction these days with compression and compression algorithms. And um, what we'll see as we go through this presentation is they continue to get better over time and they're not, <laughs> it's commonly happens in the industry that we associate video quality with a compression algorithm. You know, 4K is H.265 um, or, you know, th th those are hmm, different things that are sometimes uh, misattributed. And I want to go through the, the presentation and the different types of compression and explain that misattribution and uh, the, the, the different ways that we can actually go through and compress uh, video technology. So uh, what actually happens when you compress video is that we take a picture, which you can see on the screen here as an iframe. Uh, an iframe you can consider to be a full image. It's not interpreted in any way, shape, or form. There's not any guesswork that's happening. And that picture is used as a reference frame for the predictive frames and the bidirectional frames that are then used to guess uh, what's going to happen. Um, and in the what you see here um, is uh, a group of picture structure from a typical compressed video feed. And so at the right, at the far end on the right would be another iframe. And so an iframe is the actual picture and maybe 15 frames later, 10 frames later uh, is another iframe, which is the actual picture. And in between those iframes, that's your group of picture structure. And in some of your more uh, advanced encoders, and we in Z-Band have a couple of these, you can actually go in and change that group of picture structure rather than um, have it be fixed by the encoder. So if you're really interested in what's going on on your IPTV system, there are encoders out there that allow you to make adjustments to the iframes. But essentially what happens is your iframes uh, are reference frames to the rest of what's going on, and then your predictive frames will look at that iframe that's behind them, look at the iframe that's in front of them, and look at the changes between the two iframes and say, okay, well, in order for that person's head for, to have gotten from the, the middle of the picture to the top right of the picture, he has to have jumped. And so it's going to predict that motion and that color change. So all of these B frames and P frames that you see in the middle aren't actually aren't actually the images that are being transmitted by the video or aren't the images that were recorded in the raw content itself. They are guesses that the encoding algorithm is making based on what it sees from iframe to iframe, which again, coming back to this concept that you can get different algorithms or different pieces of content um, from different manufacturers, how they choose to set up their group of picture structure, um, whether they choose to use B frames at all, or whether they just use I frames and P frames, um, is some of the variance that you can have in an actual encoder itself. So, but it's important to note, kind of as we're going through this, that anytime you're compressing video, um, you are inherently then guessing at what happens from an actual image to an actual image and uh, depending on which encoder you're using or which company you're working with, those guesses can be far apart or they can be uh, relatively close together. Um, the other thing that we're doing when we're compressing video, and I wanted to kind of capture it in this slide, is we're generalizing what is happening in a group of pixels, right? So we are generalizing motion itself. So we're saying, okay, the person, the, 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 the head of the person, went from the middle of the frame to the top right of the frame in between my two actual pictures. So we are gonna guess that it moved in a caddy corner to the right direction, you know, like it would be heading towards 1.30 on a, a clock. And, and that's a guess. The other thing that we're guessing at is color. And I chose this image specifically because I like what it, it did. 
is we have all of our pixels on the far left of the image, and then we kind of re-describe them in the middle, reassemble them on the far right. Um, generally, the concept is still the same, right? I still have the brownish red earth, I still have the blue sky, I still have the brown trunk of the tree, and I still have the green leaves of the tree, but I've lost some of the detail here in the color description. We now have you know, no varying shades of green like there are in the tree. There's no apples. None of that kind of stuff uh, made it through the actual compression. So if you take a 4K video stream or an 8K video stream and you were to decide you're going to chop it down to 6 meg, 8 meg, something like that, this is going to happen um, to your image quality. There's no way to take what raw is you know, 100 megabits of data and put it down into a 6 megabit stream and not lose some of the quality of the video. And this is, you talk to some video purists, some, some folks who create content for a living, and they will tell you that the only time you actually see um, the 4K video in its purest format is at the source after it has been recorded and edited and created. Because as soon as it goes through this transmission process, as soon as Universal takes the content and sends it to uh, the broadcast companies and then the broadcast companies take it and send it to your house. You're going through this compression and decompression, encoding, decoding uh, process, and you're losing what was that true original 4K video quality. And it's not always to the extent that you see on the screen here, but it is something um, that happens. The other thing um, that we tend to do in a compression algorithm, and what you can see here on the screen, is the um, blue pixels, the, the sky in the background, we actually compress that data itself, right? Uh, so rather than say, okay, I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, 17 or 27 blue pixels uh, and send each of those bits individually or those bytes individually, the compression algorithm will compress that data and just say, okay, I need 27 times this byte and you need to rearrange them in a certain fashion. So the data itself will then actually get zipped up and recompressed so that when we have a lot of redundant pixels like we have here in the, the sky blue background, that does not get resent across the system multiple times. It gets sent once and then told on the receive end uh, how many times it should, should actually be done. Um, and so that's really what the, the basics of compression are, is we're taking this video and we're redescribing it, and almost always we are losing some level of the, the quality of the video that we have. Um, so I'm going to jump into um, the most common kind of compression types that we deal with today and then get into a little bit of what the future um, we believe of, of what compression types are and, and what's been announced and how we think that's going to affect video resolutions and broadcast TV. Um, what you have here is an MPEG-2 compression algorithm. And MPEG-2 is going to chop up your uh, 1920 by 1080 pixel set into little 8x8 blocks. And it's going to re-describe them. And so what you see here in the image is uh, an illustration of those blocks as they are uh, chopped up. And so what's going to happen with this image, um, and this would... Uh, looking at the coach that's nearest to us with the sweater tied around his hips and then his back to us, is all of this white or cream color that is in his shirt is going to get redescribed. Um, it's basically one block of whitish color, right? The, the small bits of color differentiation that you see there are going to be lost in a compression algorithm. Uh, the fans in the background that are already a little bit blurry here, even in this raw image, um, their faces are going to get redescribed and blurred out. Um, I like to think of it as the old 8-bit uh, uh, video games that you used to play, where you know you're playing a baseball game and everyone in the background is just like this static image silhouette of a person. Um, the same, it's not the same in in MPEG-2, but the the concept is similar. Where because all we can do is look at 8-bit by 8-bit squares, sometimes things get generalized. And you can see this if you ever walk up super close to a 4K TV 
um, that's playing 720 or 1080 content and, and pause the frame, you can actually see the jagged outline of the pixels as they're going down like the edge of a person's shirt or a desk or something like that, where the 8 bit by 8 bit block is being displayed on the screen. Um, and you can actually see the outline of what's going on. So MPEG-2 compression um, is widely utilized in broadcast video. This is coming from cable providers. This is coming from DirecTV, DISH. Uh, a lot of your local broadcast systems are utilizing this, um, mainly because they don't have to be terribly concerned with the, the, the bandwidth, right? If I've got an MPEG-2 stream, and like I said, my raw, 1080, we're just going to use 40 megabits per second as the, the backbone number, and I compress it to MPEG-2, I can get that down to 12 or 14 megs with MPEG-2 compression and still keep a very reasonable amount of my video quality. Like, I'm going to lose some quality every time I compress, but I'm not losing enough for it to be problematic or for it to update my, or to upset my viewer experience. So if I'm a TV broadcaster or if I'm a cable TV provider, that's fine. Like my bandwidth being at 12 or 14 megabits per second is completely acceptable. And I don't have to worry about um, clogging up my backbone or doing anything that's going to be problematic for my infrastructure if I'm at 12 or 14 meg for an MPEG-2 system. Um, however, we do have uh, technologies out there uh, like OTT services, IP streaming, mobile devices, mobile devices are the big ones, that don't have the ability to do um, 15 megabits per, per second. So we move into H.264 or um, you know, MPEG-4 Part 10 uh, video encoding. So video encoding is uh, for MPEG-4, the big, big change here is we're going to reduce bandwidth up to 50% at similar video qualities to describe the exact same frame. Um, we have more motion vectors available to us. And for the first time in encoding, we are actually gonna be able to have variable block sizes in uh, what we are looking at from an H.264 uh, standpoint. So those variable block sizes, like I said before, everything in MPEG-2 is eight by eight. H.264 doesn't have to stay to that standard. It can be 16 by 16, it can be 8 by 8, it can be 4 by 4. And then so if I've got something like you see here on the image where I have uh, blue sky in the background, okay, I'm just going to chalk that up to a 16 by 16 block and it's just going to become the color blue that it is. Uh, but then when you get into uh, like where you have the gentleman with his child here in the lower left hand corner and you've got the shirt and the baby holster and there's different colors going on there. You can cut that down to a four by four uh, set of pixels and describe what's going on in the image uh, much better than what you could previously. So the ability for the system to kind of take a look at what's important to describe versus what's not important to describe is really the big advancement of H.264. Um, Behind the scenes, one of the other things that uh, you can do with H.264 um, that I didn't put here on the, the slide because there's really no beautiful graphic way to show it, is um, the predictive frames and the bi-directional frames are better at uh, reference side of things. And this is really where it starts to save bandwidth, is if I've got a bi-directional frame in an H.264 algorithm, um, its job, because it's predicting what happens from iframe to iframe, is to guess, um, you know, how the motion changed from image to image. In the H.264 algorithm, the bidirectional frames have more reference points in order to make that guess. And bidirectional frames and predictive frames in uh, video encode coding are only going to utilize and only going to display the data uh, or send the data that they have as motion uh, from image to image or change from image to image. So the, the ability in H.264 for B frames to be better at describing that motion and more efficient to describing that motion is really um, what 
drove the the bandwidth change uh, in H.264 from MPEG-2. And then as you get into H.264 into the what's the buzz right now or will be here for at least a, another couple of months until they drop H.266, um, is H.265 and the H introduction of HEVC encoding. Um, and the big thing that HEVC encoding did is introduced, or HEVC compression did, is introduced coding tree units or CTUs, which you can see images of here on the, the right-hand side. So on the left of the image is a typical H.264 compression algorithm, which roughly chopped everything up um, into its standard 16 by 16 pixels, with the exception of areas that it chose to focus on. HEVC can do much larger blocks than that. I believe, I think I have it on the next slide, but all the way up to 64 by 64 uh, pixel blocks for description, and then go through and pick um, the areas of the images that it finds to be important or where it sees significant change or variance from iframe to iframe, and then emphasize the processing power of the encoding algorithm on those areas rather than focusing unilaterally across um, the entire image. So with HEVC, the big thing that we're doing is we're allowing the encoding alg algorithm to focus on what's important and focus its processing power and its encoding power on those areas of the image rather than saying, okay, I have to describe everything equally because everything is of equal importance. HEVC does not assume that everything in a given image or a given video file is of equal importance to the, the quality of the image itself. Um, so it again delivered us a another 50% uh, reduction in bandwidth, but it re it delivered it um, by being smarter than the the pre previous algorithms rather than uh, you know necessarily doing anything um, that was magic. It just got a lot smarter about how it describes video and where it chooses to focus versus previous iterations of um, the video. And I want to kind of pause here because as I'm going through um, MPEG-2, H.264, um, H.265, you'll notice I'm not associating it with video quality. I'm associating it with, with bandwidth. And that's because they're, even though I, I run across um, customers and the folks in the industry who tend to use these terms interchangeably, you know, HEVC is 4K or H.265 is 4K, that's, that's not accurate, right? Compression algorithms and how we choose to um, compress and describe video are completely independent from video resolution. So you can have a 4K video stream that is sent MPEG-2, and you can have a 4K video stream that is sent H.264, and you can have a 4K video stream that is sent HEVC. And the only difference that should actually take place amongst those streams of video content is that it takes more bandwidth to describe, to describe 4K in MPEG-2 than it does in H.264. And it takes more bandwidth to describe um, 4K in H.264 than it does in H.265 or HEVC. So it's not, it's not a video quality issue. The video quality should be the same, should be constant across all of these. Um, encoding platforms or encoding algorithms, and it's really just what you're doing from a um, bandwidth reduction standpoint. That's the big variance. And that's where we're seeing um, this being used. That's why you see a lot of your webcasting going H.264 is because it's a big bandwidth reduction. It's why we see a lot of our, our government customers and uh, broadcast customers or folks in the broadcast in industry that will adopt this stuff will adopt it um, primarily right now to save bandwidth and to save the cost on renting bandwidth more so than to deal with um, you know making sure they're delivering 4K. Um, so just as a, a kind of a refresher on the the three different types, you can see how much smarter um, we've gotten over the years, and this is. <laughs> This is a good thing, right? I mean, the original MPEG-2 standard was, I believe, released in 1998, and then it got revised a couple of different times. We went to H.264, then we went to H.265, and you can see 
we went from these fixed macro blocks for estimating motion and only being able to look at one frame in the past and one frame in the future um, to starting with a 64 by 64 block in HEVC and then the algorithm actually being intelligent enough to look at what's moving and what's changing and what's not moving and what's not changing and describe those things um, appropriately. So there's been massive changes over the years from um, MPEG-2 all the way up to HEVC H.265 encoding. Um, and, and that's where we're at right now. HEVC H.265 was the last and latest release um, video algorithm or broadcast video algorithm for the motion picture experts group, but they have um, moved forward with the, uh, I guess, unofficial announcement, unofficial release of H.266 or uh, what they're terming is versatile video, versatile video coding. Um, the first draft of the standard, I believe, is out and already released, and there's been some revision, some uh, demo implementation, some proof of concept stuff that has gone on, um, but the official standard is not anticipated to be released until next year, and then we are expecting to have hardware implementations of H.266 or VVC um, effective near the end of 2021. There's not a specific date on that. The cool part about what's going to go on with uh, VVC is it should support resolutions up to 16K, which I'm going to put a, a pin in that and come back to it in just a second, and also support um, encoding and description of things like 360-degree videos, uh, which are becoming more common. My um, my iPhone 10 um, will do some panoramic stuff. My wife has a Google Pixel. We were out hiking in the Rockies a couple of weeks ago, and she can do full 360 um, images and image and pictures on her Google Pixel. So this is becoming more of a thing. You know, uh, Samsung has a, a headset, I believe, that you can utilize, or a, an adapter that goes on top of a lot of their Galaxy phones that does 360. And then GoPro has some. Um, 360 cameras as well. So 360 degree video, I think, is one of the next iterations in technology that's going to be really interesting to see um, how it's deployed other than, you know, what we'll have with our, our GoPros and playing back on your computer and that kind of stuff. I want to see how 360 technology makes it into uh, the broadcast space. The other thing um, that we're expecting H.266 to do over the H.265 is be another 30 to 50 percent more effective with bandwidth description. So taking that all the way back to the beginning where I had my 40 megabit per second 1080 stream, and then if I take that down to MPEG-2, I can describe it in 15 meg. In H.264, I can describe it in 7.5. In H.265, I can describe it in 3.7. Now, that same 1080 uh, quality video with H.266, we should theoretically be able to describe that in under 2 megabits per second and still have 1080 quality video. So the amount of bandwidth that we're taking up with uh, these high-definition video systems is going to be very minimal or could be very minimal, which is going to mean a, a lot. Um, I was actually privileged enough to sit in on a, a speech the other week, which referenced a white paper from Cisco. And uh, Cisco, in their white paper, believes that 82% of the uh, Wi-Fi bandwidth that we will utilize as a part, uh, as a, a society by 2022 will be video bandwidth. So if we're 80% of our Wi-Fi data is video, um, the ability to um, describe this video and keep the quality but the limit the bandwidth is going to become more and more important as we move forward as a society because the, more, the higher percentage of the data that we are taking up um, with video, um, the, the more compression is going to become a, a big thing. And then kind of for what this means for the future, that's a transmission into that. Um, 4K and 8K are the buzzwords, right? I mean, this year, Consumer Electronics Show, um, there were TV manufacturers that had released their 8K ultra-high-definition um, televisions. The 
8K is actually full on 16 times the bandwidth of a 1080 stream. So um, at a 1080 stream, uh, you know, like we said, we could probably at maximum compression algorithms get that down to two megabits per second and describe that well. That means with H.266, the best we're going to be able to do with current technologies and current implementations is describe 8K in uh, about a 30 to 35 megabit stream. That is probably an optimistic estimate, um, diving into where this is my opinion here, more so than something that would maybe be consensus within the industry. Um, but even with the advent of H.266 and uh, versatile video coding, it looks like we are a long way from uh, broadcast. You know, you're not going to get uh, 8K video from your service provider uh, any time in the near future because there's going to be you know, 2021 is going to be the first hardware implementation. There's going to be a burn in time. And then the broadcast industry, um, you know, has been relatively, I won't say slow, but they've not all jumped on the bandwagon of having every channel or every piece of content created in 4K as it is. So if they haven't done the infrastructure updates, um, to get to 4K at this point in time, it's unlikely by you know 2022 that they're all going to jump on board and start doing 8K video. So from where we're at from a, a TV distribution side of things or from a, a broadcast video side of things, we're kind of approaching uh, what's the theoretical limit here for, for a little while. Um, with H.265, with H.266, uh, 4K, maybe up to 8K is going to be about the maximum video resolution that we would be able to discuss um, from a, a broadcast transmission standpoint without a, a, a basically another jump forward in compression technologies and algorithms. Um, and it was several years between the release of H.265 and, and H.266. So from a, an industry standpoint, when we look at this, um, if you've got a 4K TV right now, you're, you're probably good for a, a little while. Um, it, it, the technology in the industry, which you know, it's an industry where, it, as a country, the analog to digital transition started officially um, in September of 2008. September 8th, 2008, Wilmington, North Carolina was the first city to go full digital for their over-the-air broadcast. Um, 10 years later, now we have 4K and 8K technologies, and uh, we might actually be reaching a point of, of stasis here for a little bit, where over the next five years, you're, you're going to see what you have. Maybe just we will get better at how we present these things, or we'll get a little bit better at how we transmit things, but there's not a leap forward coming to the industry in the next three to five years where we're going to be doing you know, 16K broadcast to your house. And uh, with the compression algorithms that we have now, just being able to describe 360 degree video, we're a long way from being able to describe holographic content and things that you know, we would see, see in, in Star Trek. So I wanted to kind of put this together. I wanted to take a look at the, the world of video and compression algorithms and where it's at right now, because uh, something that we get asked about a lot, you know, do you support 4K? Do you support... 8K, what do you see coming down the line? And I felt like it was important content to share with our customers. Um, also have some really good sources um, that I used in putting this thing together, which if you want to do some reading, I would recommend um, taking a look at absolutely any of these links. Um, Cisco's got some really nice stuff. Digital Trends was uh, very helpful. I pulled some of the images from these web pages as well. And uh, obviously the IEEE was useful in going through and getting into it, reading through some of the ins and outs of you know, video compression and how it works. So if you want to take a deeper dive into any of these compression technologies, it would definitely recommend you uh, get on these websites and, and do some reading. Um, and that is basically the end of my presentation today. Uh, again, a little different than our traditional Z-band presentations where we are diving into a particular product, uh, but more just general industry knowledge that we felt w would be important for our customers and our customer base. Um, if 
I'll hang out here for a couple of minutes. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, chat them in. And if not, I will um, let everybody know when I'm officially signing off. All right, I got a couple of comments from folks, but no questions. Thank you guys very much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, and we will obviously send out a follow-up email to everyone that attended, and you will have access to this um, presentation. Oh. Um, so, hmm. okay, I did get a question as I was, I was signing off there. Uh, questions from Angela Gibson. This is what talking points do we use when when we're discussing this with clients? Um, so one of the big questions that we have for all of our clients is how they intend to use video um, within their infrastructure. Uh, and that sounds like a silly question, but it actually uh, the answers are widely varied, right? Um, you talk to a healthcare facility and they just want to get cable TV out to the patient room so patients have ESPN to watch or kids can watch Disney while they're there and getting the treatment um, that they require. That's a completely different use case than a news organization who's going to record content and play it back and make sure that they are getting accurate quotes or they're um, looking at highlights or writing articles for uh, news or sports goings on uh, as things are happening. So there's a, there's a ton of different use cases. And then you obviously have uh, the digital signage side of things, video on demand, uh, archiving of content. So we don't necessarily have a discussion um, with our customers on the video quality, quality that they want as, as much as we have a discussion with our customers on how they intend to use video in, in their infrastructure. And then based on their feedback and, and how important they believe video is in their organization, that's that's how we'll move forward with them. Um, and that's how we'll decide which products are appropriate for their application, um, which systems they should use, or um, when necessary, which partners we should bring in to help fulfill their requirements. So the answer to the question there is, um, we kind of let them tell us the answer. The general question is, how do you intend to use your video system? How important is it to you? And we let that discussion guide guide everything else. Um, all right, I haven't seen um, another question there on uh, distinction between, uh, again, from Angela, uh, between ourselves and our potential competitors. Um, so the, the big thing that we believe that we have as Z-Band is our story to all of our customers is that you don't need to pull coax to accomplish what it is you want to accomplish in your um, your your video infrastructure, right? Um, and that's our story. And then we have that conversation. You cannot pull coax, and you can use an RF system and tune with TVs as you have for years, or you cannot pull coax and put in a full IPTV platform, and we can offer you both solutions. Whereas pretty much everyone that we compete with in the industry is coming in and saying, you know, we sell IPTV or we sell amplifiers or we sell digital signage. And they're coming to you kind of with their solution set a little more defined than what ours is. And I think the big distinction that we have is our flexibility and is our ability to adapt to our customers' needs, right? If, if whether you want to go RF, whether you want to go IPTV, whether you want to do video on demand, whether you want to do digital signage, we have solutions that are there and adaptable for all of those infrastructures. And I think that is what makes us a little bit different than a lot of the other folks in the industry right now. And 
All right. I don't see any other questions. You're welcome, Angela. I appreciate um, the feedback and the questions. So I am going to sign off. Like I said, everyone will get a follow-up email and you'll have access to this content through our GoToWebinar platform. Thank you guys very much. Have a great day.